So today is the last day of the five sessions. So when we study and discuss about meditation, we are trying to develop what is known as emotional, emotional awareness or emotional intelligence. There are many people who have written books on emotional awareness and emotional intelligence, which basically means to be cognizant and aware of the different emotions that you develop in your mind. And then see the the niya dua shuksa de de a shuna de a pe de tungba tu de yang kau tu di ni yang kau rawak kau So emotional intelligence or emotional awareness basically means, as I said, to be cognizant or aware of the emotions the positive emotions and negative emotions that we develop in our daily life. And with the positive emotions, we need to know them and make friendship with them. As I said the other day, compassion, please come, have a nice cup of tea, loving kindness, please come, join me for lunch, something like that, you know. Develop this close feeling and slowly, slowly, slowly make it a part of your life. So that's what we are talking about. Whether we are talking about meditation or we are talking about Buddhist practice, we are talking primarily about, about removing these negative emotions. That you need to remember. Because the ultimate purpose of our life is happiness. And uh, those that obstruct our happinesses are the negative emotions, the destructive emotions. So the destructive emotions are, are our sworn enemy. They are our real enemy. Not the enemy, not so much of the enemy outside. Okay? Whatever unfortunate things, obstructions, hindrances, difficulties and problems that we encountered in this world are primarily due to negative emotions, directly or indirectly. So they are our enemy. So Dharma practitioner, for a Dharma practitioner, the, the, the only thing one has to do is to recognize these negative emotions and deal with them, to reduce them, to weaken them, to fight them. So just as a soldier goes to the battlefield to fight, he has to collect, he has, he has to adopt all the needed strategy, he has to have all the needed arms and weapons. So all these positive emotions like loving kindness, compassion, wisdom, so forth, these are the weapons to fight and destroy the negative emotions. So this is a very important project, you see. If you don't want happiness, peace, then okay. But that is something that we can never do away with. We want happiness, we want peace. Not only happiness and peace, but long-lasting peace and happiness. Since this is our genuine need, therefore you need to adopt those ways and means that leads to the development of this long-lasting peace and happiness. So this is a very crucial, important, you know, subject. Whether you believe in religion or not believe in religion, there's a different matter. Religion is not absolutely necessary. But these negative emotions must be dealt with, even if you are a non-believer. So that's why His Holiness the Dalai Lama is so much talking about secular ethics education. We are now working very hard to develop curriculum of teaching secular ethics education from kindergarten to college. We have, we have already finished the, the manuscript, the draft copy, and very soon, of course, it is a very important project, difficult project, so we'll come up with different ways and means to teach those programs so that it will benefit everybody, believer, non-believer, even those who are anti-religion. That's important. <coughs> Then on top of that, in the case of those of us who believe in a particular religion, like Buddhism, then there's added, added advantage of going deeper 
advantage of developing further on the foundations that we establish in the form of secular ethics and so on. Okay, so that's really, really important. So now what, what do you have to do? What you have to do is, you need to look at yourself all the time, watch yourself all the time. This is the part of the practice. When you get angry, when you're about to get angry, then you should think about something else. Change the subject, you know, think about something else. Just like the breathing meditation. And then try to reduce it. Sometimes the situation may be such that you may not be able to control anger immediately. You will immediately burst out, which I also sometimes do. You immediately burst out, say something. You know, you get angry, things like that. But then, after having done that, the next important thing is, don't keep it in your mind. Don't keep it in your mind. Don't develop resentment. Don't develop hatred. That's the most dangerous thing. Anger, okay, it's not good, but if it comes, and then after that, if you don't maintain ill will, then it's okay, then it will not destroy your happiness. That's very, very important, and that we can do. I'll give you one example. For example, look at our situation. If you have a friend, let us say, somebody who has your friend for the last, say, 30 years, not just friend, but hand and glove friend, as we say, very close friend, very close friend, 30 years, okay? Okay, just like one person. Now let us say this morning during the breakfast, we had some disagreement and had, had some heated argument. Okay, because of that, we stop seeing each other, talking to each other. And look at this particular situation. On the one hand, you had this unpleasant experience of, say, five minutes of verbal fighting. On the other hand, you have this long story of 30 years great friendship. Now, how come that you are able to remember these five minutes <laughs> verbal fighting and not able to remember that 30 years of long friendship? So this clearly shows how strong we are controlled by the negative emotions. So therefore, on such an occasion, what you need to do is, okay, it happens, you know, you are, not, you, are, you are an ordinary person, you have strong presence of negative emotions, you burst out, you get angry, you say bad things, sometimes even hit others. But then after that, the anger will cool down. There's nobody who remains anger all the, angry all the time, right from breakfast till late in the whole day when going to the office, talk, <coughs> angry. nobody gets angry the whole, the, the whole 24 hours. So your anger will cool down. So after your anger cools down, then you should think good things about this person, the 30 years friendship, whatever, you know. And next when you meet, don't avoid him. <coughs> try to smile or try to say something, you see. And the best is immediately after fighting, when the anger has cooled a little bit down, go to him, hug him, touch him, cry if that is needed. Say sorry. Whoever is on the fault, it was a mistake, you know. Remember, we have been such a good friend for the last 30 years. If you are able to do that, you are a good practitioner. You will be the winner then. You will strengthen that friendship further. But now look at the ordinary way of doing things. If you do something like that, then people say, oh, maybe he made the mistake, that's why he's asking for forgiveness. You see? This is the stupid ordinary way of doing things. So, we do get angry, but try to talk to that person sooner or later, as if nothing has happened. Just as you do with your kids. Like if your kids fight with you, get angry, you also get angry. Never talk to him. Then how can the family run to live together, you see? We are able to do this with our family members, but not with others, clearly showing that we don't have respect and love to others. Love minimizes the fault. 
If you have love, genuine love, genuine affection, the person looks nicer. Even that person gets angry, it looks nicer. You are able to talk to him still. You see? So this kind of practices we must... You don't just wait for a Buddhist text or Buddhist teacher to talk about all these things. Based on your own life's experience, you can learn all these things. Contrarily, if you have a fight with somebody, then after that you refuse to talk to each other. I mean, if you are, say, working in the same office, how can you remain like that, not talking to each other because you had a fight or disagreement, you know? How unpleasant <coughs> to live like this to, together, you see. So that is how we should do the practice. Then you can see the change, you can see the benefit, you see. Okay. So we were discussing about the seven limb practice. We had not even finished the six preparatory practices and uh, one of the six preparatory practices was the seven limb practices. Now the seven limb practice is very important. For a beginner like us, the practice of these six preparations and the seven branch practices are extremely, extremely important to purify your negative emotions and to collect virtue. This is important. The purpose of doing such seven limb practice is because we have con committed many negative deeds. As far as negative works are concerned, we have done many of them. As far as collecting merits are concerned, we did not do much. Difficult for us to do prayer, difficult for us to go around the temple, difficult for us to talk nicely to other people. So collecting merit is not easy. Collecting demerit or doing bad things is, comes automatically, easily. If you are to cultivate compassion, it's very difficult. What is compassion? How to do it? With anger? comes out like that. But then, if you look at the nature, you see, think carefully, then like anger, there's nobody who right in the morning makes a motivation, today I will get angry. So that shows we don't like anger. And after having got angry with somebody, having fought with somebody, there's nobody who who will at the end of the day say, today I fought with somebody, so I really enjoyed the day. So clearly showing that you also don't like it. But still, out of ignorance, out of the force of negative emotions, you are compelled to do those things. So automatically we end up doing many wrong things, many negative emotions. Two, less merit, more negative emotions. And then also we have, we have we engage in activities which would further take away from doing Dharma practices. When you are able to do Dharma practice, somebody comes and obstructs you. When somebody is able to do Dharma practice, you sometimes obstruct them, you see. Tell Parji Chekin Mangudua. Chu Che the Yakuri, the Chu Kalate me, singing Mangudua. Go ahead, the Pesha Sogores, Labgrava. Pesha Sogomare singing Yomare de Inako, the Labdan Dujarwa, Chogi Kala Temes. Then I know some conyu the Dilavi. There are people who say, ah, oh, Dharma may be important, but that will not give you food. You have to earn, you have to get money. And many people say and think like that, you see. Of course, you have to earn, but that does not mean to say that spiritual practice is not important. And in fact, when you do, sometimes I feel the greatest earning you do is through spiritual practice. Because number one, you earn huge heaps of merit. Sona mangosa. Sona mangosa na? Rawa, sonam na mi dete dungi thamji sel. Sonam de me mi samba nam jan doobs labre. If you collect merit, it will give, give you positive fruit. It will dispel sufferings. A person with merit is able to successfully fulfill all his objectives. So now, me do lega jishu na mara, visa jishu na mara. Da ko de wo chia wai na thang mang na chin sing de yor MBC na. Ro, tingu doa. Ngu ne he chen da re da. 
Not the Papa Chakana, Japjure, Dirian Cosonam, Chug, Tess, Yo, and Carriage, and Tessic, Mario de Soros, do what I do still. Say it to me that mean do the Carina, you do what? The already. So, therefore, it's important to understand these facts. Okay? Not just believing in only concrete material things. <laughs> So, therefore, it is because of this, having collected a lot of <coughs> negative deeds and having not collected merit, having engaged in actions that would deprive you further from religious practice, and having encountered other people who would obstruct your practices in order to counteract against these, you engage in the seven limb practice. For example, with, the, with prostration and uh, confessing of negative deeds, it will act as an antidote against your having committed wrong deeds. And by making offerings and rejoicing the good activities, you counteract against having not accumulated merit. And having requested a teacher to give the Dharma teaching, having requested the teacher not to die, not to pass away, this will become a cause so that you are not deprived or will not engage in non-meritorious activities. And if you dedicate your virtuous practices, then you will find less people interrupting you. Occasionally I am switching on to Tibetan because there are many who <laughs> Who are studying Tibetan? <laughs> oh yeah, looks like that. Then the sixth preparatory practice is making mandala offering and making supplication. Make a mandala offering, and then you should make the supplication by saying, "Whatever misconceptions." that I've developed, including not respecting the teacher or seeing things as having inherent existence. May I be able to get rid of all these misconceptions. Contrarily, there are positive thoughts like respecting spiritual teacher, cultivating the right path and so forth. May I be able to cultivate all those positive qualities quickly. Quickly. Quickly means, for example, people engage in tantric practice. And tantric practice is said to be the quick path. Why do you have to join the quick path? Because you want to get rid of your suffering quickly. If you are somebody who says, oh, I have no problem, you know, I'm very tolerant with the sufferings and problems. I'm fine with the negative emotion. There's nobody who says things like that. Therefore, there's urgency <coughs> to engage in practices like Tantra. But in order to undertake Tantra practice, you must have the foundations. It's not enough that the teaching is profound. The practitioner should also be profound. So therefore, for us, it is bet better to establish the foundation properly. So even in that level, there is urgency. For example, if you have a headache, you would like to immediately go to hospital to take medicine because you don't want to stay with that headache. So similar is the case with many of the sufferings which we know, and there are many sufferings which we don't know. That's why it is important to study Dharma. There are many sufferings which we don't even know that they are sufferings. We think they are peace, they are happiness. Like, for example, buying a new car. Or when you are very cold, sitting in sunshine. You think that is peace, that is happiness. But how long can you stand in sunshine? After some time, oh, it's too hot, you want to move to the shade, you see. So that means it's, it's changing. It's called Njurve uh, Dunge. It's conditioned, contaminated happiness, which changes soon into suffering. Like food, when we are hungry, we need to eat. 
But how much you will eat? When I was a student of, I was a, when I was studying economics, I had studied this thing called law of marginal utility. That means when you are angry, you know, hungry, if there is bread available, okay, the first bread is really nice, delicious. Second also okay, third also okay. Then you keep on eating, then you start vomiting. You can't eat further. Law of marginal utility. So clearly showing from these things you won't get that long-lasting peace and happiness. Similarly friends, when you don't have friends, you long for friend. When you have a friend, there's additional suffering. When you don't have many brothers and sisters, you wish, oh, this person has ten sisters, ten brothers, how nice if I also have that. But the more you have those things, it does not come value-free. Lucho nam lang goa chinye ba tihi suji dunge chinye to hitting nam ladua. In Nagarjuna's letter to the friend, he gives an example of the king of Nagas, which is snake. Nagas means kind of snake. So the king of Nagas is said to have many heads. So the ordinary snakes have only one head. So comparing to the ordinary snake, this king of the Naga literally looks grand with so many heads. But the problem is the more head you have, the more there is likelihood of getting one of it hard, you see. Go dikyo menaya and dikyo kyurgariya. Dua. Go chik mato mena kochyo shana mato shana shori ma dua. Tere dua. So therefore the wealth, the name and fame, you know, they are not the source of long lasting peace and happiness. And then you make the supplication that whatever obstruction is there for me, practice external obstruction, internal obstruction, may all these obstructions be completely cleared. Tanga chuchiki, that shit and nongi parji karyon, shiver show, said Molam Tabu, the celebrity. Rua, Molam Sabji, Kalo Jur celebrity. Molam Sabji, Kalo Jur. Making prayer is expressing your wish. So prayer, prayer is compared to the, the bridle of a horse. <laughs> By using the bridle, the horse can be taken into different directions. So with prayer, when you express your motivation, according to the motivation, according to your wish, you follow that path, you can go to that direction. So it's a very important thing. It's not just the movement of the leaf, but it is expressing the desire. So these are the preparations for your meditation. Then for the actual meditation. Now actual meditation means whatever topic you choose. If you are going to meditate on the importance of spiritual teacher, then you meditate on that. Five days, two weeks, one month, just on that. Or impermanence, or bodhicitta. Whatever topic you choose, having made the preparation is same, the process of preparation is same. Then with actual meditation, depending upon whatever topic you want to choose. Rama, choose that topic. Now, as I briefly explained earlier, first you need to identify the meaning of word meditation. As I said, meditation basically means getting your mind habituated with that object, with that subject that you are going to meditate. Particularly in the case of, uh, uh, there, again there, are, we don't have much time, but there are many types of meditation. For example, if you are focusing on the image of the Buddha, then the object of meditation is out there. You look at it carefully, you look at it carefully, look at it carefully, study it carefully. First you choose, choose an image which is nicely made. Unfortunately, sometimes people you know, do to sell something quickly, you know, they don't make images or painting nicely these days. So you should choose one which is really nicely made. Then look at it. Then without looking, because you can't take that image wherever you go for meditation, you know. So you look at it, then without looking at it, try to remember it. Get a mental picture. 
So that mental picture, mental image, is the object of your meditation. I remember one of my Israeli friends, you know, a young woman who came many, many years when I was translating for Israel, and she was dying to study Buddhism. I just met her. And then I said, okay, I'll help you a few days. So one day she visited the temple. You know, she has a, she has a Jewish background. And came to me and said, I feel very uncomfortable. Why? I said, why? Because the Tibetans are prostrating in front of the image. Because the, in the Jewish tradition, they don't do that, you see. Then I said, okay, if you don't feel comfortable. Then I said, do you carry the photos of your families and friends around? She said, yes. I said, you're stupid, like the Tibetans. <laughs> then I asked, I asked her, why do you take those photos? They're not the real person. She said, no, no, I know there's no real person, but it help, helps me remember that. So this is what we do with the image also. No stupid person thinks this is the real Buddha, but through that image we remember the Buddha. Okay? So that has to be remembered mentally. So therefore you look at it, study it carefully, and then try to get a picture of it. Now you have started your meditation, when you, having looked at it carefully, and when you try to reflect on it, <coughs> you know, it, you will get a very hazy picture, you know. Nose is not clear, face is not clear, eye is not clear. And then in addition to that, hundred thousand things which you don't want to meditate will come. You see? I know another Western nun who, who once came to me and said, Geshe-la, before I meditated I was a nice person. <laughs> After I meditated I became a bad person. You see? Because as, as soon, normally when you don't meditate, when you don't develop that awareness, when you don't think, all these negative, host of negative emotions are coming all the time, but nobody, there's no choki there. Nobody watching, you know, they can come and your, your mind is empty. So the negative emotions are coming and going, playing with you as they wish, and nobody is raising a finger against them. So you, so, so you don't know. But now as soon as you meditate, then you see how many of these, those things are coming. When you try, try to meditate on an image of the picture, you will suddenly find yourself shopping in New York, you see. <laughs> so then you have to say, no, 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 no shopping, please come back. <laughs> Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. <laughs> Buddha's image. So that's, that's the practice you need to do. Repeatedly you have to do, repeatedly you have to do. Then slowly, 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 the picture will become clearer. But in the beginning, don't try to get a very clear picture of the whole body, especially the part, the eye, nose. If you are able to get slight, more or less good picture, <coughs> then be satisfied with that. But if you try to see each and everything as if you are actually looking, it will be difficult. So just to get a good picture of the, the overall image. When you are able to do that, then you can shift and focus on his eye or nose, you know, like that. So it takes time. It takes time. So what is most important is whatever you are focusing on, Try to just remember that and the others you should say, go away, go away, go away. I have not asked you to come. Go away, go away. So there are two hindrances, excitement and dullness. Excitement means, excitement means when you try to meditate on the image of the Buddha, suddenly the mind loses the object and remembers the picnic that you had last month. So you are physically sitting there, eye also a little bit closed, looks like meditating, but mentally you are picnicking. You see? So that is called excitement. You get so excited, you know. You, you, either you are picnicking or you remember the friend you met last time or the holiday you had with your parents and things like that, you see. That's called excitement, you know. At that time you need to tell, mind, don't get too excited. You are in the samsara. Don't get too excited. You are going to die soon, you see. So think about something that will have sobering effect on your mind. So that will calm the mind down a little bit and the mind will again stay on the object. Now again there is a likelihood that the mind instead of getting too excited, it will become so dull that gradually you are losing the object and half sleeping, very comfortable because you know when you start sleeping then the body becomes a little bit more warm, you know. And then, then you really, especially in winter, you know. <laughs> 
So really, when people think you are meditating, but you are sleeping, you see. So if you get habituated with this kind of meditation, then it is said that the mind becomes very, very dull. You might think, you know, you might spend months and sometimes years with this bad habit, thinking you are meditating because temporarily you feel comfortable. You know, you don't take care of any responsibility of going up, going down, pretend that you are meditating and sleeping. But if you get habituated with this kind of habit, then your mind, instead of becoming sharp, will become very dull. So therefore, there are meditators. There are people who say they meditated for a long, long time, but they are totally insensitive to the needs of others. Very angry, very insensitive, you know, and dull not even able to use their common sense. There are people like that. So that shows that they, they did wrong meditation. So therefore when you meditate, you should you know, make an effort in such a way that the mind, you know, simply sesha da nesha sesha the clarity of the object must be there, number one. Second, stability. The mind should stay stably on the object. Now to, 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 to enable to do that, you need to employ these two things called mindfulness and conscientiousness. Mindfulness means to make sure that the mind stays on the object and conscientiousness is whether it's not wandering outside the object or not. Okay? So now you can see, you know, you can spend a lot of time on this. And if you are able to make some improvement on this, then in all other areas, whatever work you do, you will, you will be different you will be different. You will be able to pay more attention to the job in hand, not only spiritual practice, but whatever job is, you will be able to study carefully, you know. Otherwise, you know, our monkey mind is so, so cunning and ready to run everywhere. You know, we are not able to concentrate reading only one page, you see. <laughs> you know, you concentrate if you concentrate, you know, you will, you will start enjoying that subject. Even if you're reading one page, just, just your mind be there in that page. Otherwise, close the door and do some, close the book and do, do something else. But sometimes what we do is, the book is open, the mind is wandering, you know. I'm investing time. So therefore, removing these two obstructions, dullness and distraction, and make sure that your mind stays on the object. So in the beginning, one of the very good object of meditation is Buddha's image. So as I said, imagine that the Buddha's image is on the on the height, you know, similar same to the height of your mid eyebrow. The distance is about your one length prostration. Around the distance, the height is similar to your mid eyebrow. Imagine that Buddha's image. In the beginning, that Buddha's image. Then, having got this clue, now as I said, it's not the image but the mental reflection. And then you see, see that image full of light, full of illumination. The Buddha's face is also compassion and also smiling, things like that. And then gradually you see, it's not just image, this is a real Buddha, a living person. <laughs> so if you do that, then you get double benefit. One, you are able to do meditate. Second, you also, your mind also gets habituated with the Buddha. See, in the dream also the Buddha will appear. Last night I got a dream of landing up at an airport and my, both my passport and RC got lost. I mean, <laughs> so you get all kinds of dreams, you know. But they come to the So meditation means getting habituated with the object and particularly a positive object because you don't get don't you don't need to get habituated with negative emotions there you're already advanced meditator 
Rawa. So it's clear. Gom gom jingunzi. Rawa. This is. The the purpose of meditation is as I explained earlier, that we are controlled by our mind. Our mind is prim, prim, primarily prim, primarily controlled by negative emotions. <laughs> So therefore, now you need to make your mind habituated with the positive emotions so that you are able to get rid of the negative emotions. This is the purpose of meditation. That's all. Now how to do a good meditation versus bad meditation? Now good meditation means if you are meditating on impermanence, first you read and study properly about impermanence. What do we mean by impermanence? If there are different types of impermanence, impermanence of life, impermanence of death, separation, and so forth. Think about that carefully. If there are many numbers to be remembered, remember the numbers. Then also the order, how you should meditate. That's important. Because if you miss one of the numbers, you miss something in your meditation. If the order is reshuffled, then it's like a, a physician, a physician giving the wrong, giving the medicine in the wrong way. Main, main, korim takta mati na, pamei na thangko na sa yallang ek main chikte. Then na sa pain le main chikte shaku do. Even when we prepare food, if you put everything, it will not. The food will not taste. Nicely. So there are certain things you put first, certain <coughs> things you put in the end, and so on. Korim machu watch. That is one. So that's how you should meditate. Then at the end of the meditation, you should dedicate all the virtuous qualities that you have uh, actualized for the benefit of all sentient beings by reciting prayers like Sankuchopa Arya Badra prayer or Molam Dunjuba 70 verses prayer by uh, Ashava Gosha, Lopempawe Molam Dunjuba. And then with ardent very strong prayer, dedicate all the virtues that you earned to, be, to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Rawa. Now with regard to the time of the meditation, the best time for meditation is dawn, early in the morning, and then evening, then dusk. If you're able to get a little bit earlier, then everything is quiet and your mind is also fresh. It will be very nice. But many people are so fond of sleeping, you know. Very difficult to get up, especially these days, you know. Sleeping like a dog, as we say, you know. Even if you're able to get up around five, it's not too early. It will be very nice. And by the time people get up, you've already done so many things. That's why people say, the time you have and the time Mahatma Gandhi had or Mother Teresa had, same, 24 hours. So many of this, the Buddha also had the same time. But they achieved so much, we didn't achieve much. Why? Because we kept on sleeping, gossiping, distracted, you see. That's the thing. So if you want to achieve something great, you need to do a little bit differently. That's the time. And with the process of meditation, actual process of meditation, in the beginning, it should be short sessions of meditation, 10 minutes or so, short session. Not long, because you're not, your, your body is not habituated with that. Your mind is not ready. If you push yourself, the next time your mind will say, no, I don't want to meditate. Yeah. 
Gom san kiese doa san kiese na gom yak wodo de galen kie gores de kia gores men your meditation is really going nicely ten minutes then stop it that will make you feel like coming back and then also the the place where you're going to meditate as I briefly explained clean the place as I said earlier make it interesting the altars are nice the place is clean the meditation seat looks nice you know there are so many things lying around you know not like that. Then you feel like coming. It's not only for meditation. For a good writer, for a good student also, you have to you have to prepare those things that will inspire you to study. Prepare a nice chair, nice table, put some nice dictionaries there, your laptop, computer there. You feel like coming, you see. And you say you are a research scholar, you are a student. There's no sign of dictionary, no sign of table, no place to see it, you know. It's not inspiring, you see. So this I read in, in, the, in the books, which talks about how to become a writer. So the place should be inviting, the place should be inviting. Hmm. And if your meditation is becoming a little bit more stable, then you can prolong the session, prolong the period. So in all these processes, you should not force yourself. And uh, if you're, med- for example, when you are doing the meditation, if you feel sl- you are feeling too sleepy, then do- don't just force yourself. Get up, have a nice cup of tea, go for a short walk. You know, wash your face, whatever. And think about something that will cheer up your mind. Then come back. Okay. And what, what you should do during the post-meditative session? During the medita- meditative session, whatever you are thinking, you're, you look nice. You're sitting there. The, the nice altar is in front, you know, people might think, okay, he's doing his practice. It looks nice. How successful you are, it's up to you. But at least it looks nice. But the real trouble starts when you get up from the meditation and go to your work, mix with other people, go with your co-workers. That is post-meditative session. So post meditative session is even more important. The meditative session is like charging the battery. Why should you charge the battery so that you are able to use the light when you go into darkness? So similarly, when you do the meditation, you are charging so that during the post meditative session, when you meet all kind of strange people, when you encounter all kind of rough and tough time, then at that time you should be able to use that meditative practices that you have done. That is That is the test of the pudding. There is a story, you know, of somebody who said he is a great practitioner on uh, practitioner and med- meditator on patience. So he was sitting there in the forest, not moving, you know. When people came and said, what are you doing? I am meditating on patience. Then you eat my shit. Somebody said, teased him by saying, you eat my shit. And that so-called meditator immediately said, you eat my shit. <laughs> so that is the thing, you see. So that takes time. Sitting alone and looking nice is okay, it's good. It has its benefit, you see. But the real test is how are you going to live with other people? When you meet so many people with so many mental dispositions, so many ways of thinking, so many ways of, you know, conducting, then you should be able to live harmoniously with these people. Or even with the hostile situation environment. Teach it. As I said earlier, the purpose of medicine is so that when you get sick, it's able to cure. When you're healthy, you don't need meditation or medicine. So similarly, when you are in trouble, 
when someone, someone from your family dies, or when there is a tragedy, at that time then the spiritual practice, meditation must come and benefit you. So on those difficult times, you also cry like any other people. You also become helpless like any other people then. What is the benefit of the practice? The kayo lao yoji gorova. Tharwa da thamji chimpa zinda tharin bura da di. Di kong lo thabi yoji gorova. As I said, nirvana and enlightenment is too far, to be honest. But the key question is, are we going to get something before that? Yes! As I said, if you do the practice as I've explained, as this text has explained, then you will benefit immediately, on the spot. And through that way, then of course you are gradually moving towards nirvana and enlightenment. So that's important. So during the post meditative session, you can do good practices like doing prostration, going around the temple, reciting prayers and so forth. But the most important thing is during the post meditative session, you should again study about those subjects which you are going to meditate during the actual meditation. For example, if the subject you are going to meditate is impermanence, then during meditative state, you may not be able to remember everything. So during the post meditative state, then you read again. And that's very helpful. And many of us, I mean, when we study, we do like that. And I, I do like that. For example, I read book a little bit like this, then I close and try to remember nothing. When you're reading, it seems everything is clear, but when you close, nothing. Then you try, try to remember. Then again look. And then few lines come in the mind. So like then you're able to remember. Rigpa ligvam nang su dang silavre. Sosul rigpa di pecha nang liyo na peng marwa. Sosul gorwa. Sosul liyo vache gorwa. Knowledge must be there with you, not in the book. Rwa. O dire. Ha? Then in order to achieve further success in meditation like Kame abiding, Shamat and Vipassana, Hine Dan Lagdung, then there are many additional kind of courses that you must collect. Or even in ordinary meditation also there are many courses and conditions that must be fulfilled. For example, it, one of the very important uh, course is restrain your senses. Wombu go dombas. Close the, restraining the senses. The eye sees so many things. The ear hears so many things. The nose wants to smell so many things. The body wants to touch so many things. The tongue wants to taste so many things. You know, that's why all these restaurants opened up, you know. And then the mind chases the senses in the pursuit of the sensual objects. Then you get all the problem. That's why we are talking about having more contentment, less desire. The more you have desire, the less contentment you have, the more you will become a slave to the dictates of the senses. The senses will always say, I want this, I want this, I want this. When you, your eyes see something, I want this, I want this. And those of you who have, you have attended my talks earlier, you know, you will remember I've explained the big malls. The big malls, if you visit a big mall, these big malls are developed in accordance, in accordance with the needs of the customers. The eye wants to see something, so they have one floor of television. That's what you want. You move to the next floor, Restaurants, your tongue wants that. Next floor, CDs, DVDs, music. Next floor, clothes for touch. Like that, you see. So it is because of our lack of contentment, desire, the market is flooding with all so many things. So if we have a little bit more contentment and less desire, many of this unwanted things are rubbish that is flooding the market, they, they, they can be minimized, you see. We can talk a lot about those things. But anyway, you are going to get into trouble. 
if you run after all these sensual objects. And forget about meditation. <laughs> Your money will be gone. And meditation is not possible. Therefore, you must restrain the senses. Because if you don't restrain the senses, when the senses go after undesirable objects, then you develop all the negative emotions. There's the problem. The second very important thing is, whatever you are going to do, do it consciously. Don't go, go around like a zombie. Consciously, where am I going right now? I mean, some people, you know, they are so childish. I mean, maybe good nature, I don't know. But some people say, let us go to Maglur Ganj. Yes, okay, go to Ganj. Let us go down to Kota Bazaar. Okay, go to go. No idea what they are doing, you know. They are simply led by the nose, by other people. So, Dinde Maji Sivarada. If you want to do good practice, or want to achieve something in your life, do things with full awareness. Where am I going? The place where I am going, is it a good place or bad place? Is the restaurant I'm going is a good restaurant, bad restaurant? The poor person to whom I'm going to meet is a good person or bad person? Is it better to go or not, not to go? <coughs> Think carefully, especially these days, you see. Engage and do things with full awareness. While you are widely awake, And likewise, physically also, you should check what your hand is doing, what your mouth is saying, how your eye is looking, you see? Even when you laugh, there are so many ways of laughing. Sarcastic smile, mm -hmm. smile also, friendly smile. So you should check how you are smiling, how you are laughing, what is your hand gesture, how you are walking, you see. Very, very important. So engage consciously. So in short, whether it's something that you are doing in the day, something that you are doing in the night, remember what you are doing. And if you realize that what you are doing is wrong, don't engage into it. Stop doing that. For example, if you are somebody who is, who is engaging a lot of smoking, I mean, don't try to justify it, you know. And then make it make it make a motivation that from henceforth I will do like this, not like this. So in short, whatever you are doing, engage into those activities with full awareness. Full awareness, that's the thing. If you do like that, in this life also you will not engage in any wrongdoings. And after you die, you will also not fall into negative state of existence. And you will also be able to collect much merit, which will help you move from lower spiritual paths to higher spiritual paths. In short, you will be able to lead a life where you don't have to regret. Pecha <laughs> 
king wa dindi chemo go ches there are things which you might be engaging right now happily and laughing but it could be the cause which will bring tear when you die like dua what did it and then with your food also there should if you are meditator practitioner or even for your health there should be moderation in your food moderation in your food tanga do phebara je na do thona shibu che go do chu chu se ga che shibu se ga che khala sa tama shin de sab sab che go je so so it says have moderation in food that means don't eat too little if you eat too little you will have no energy to do the practice in today's world there are people who eat very little and they kill themselves especially among ladies in some places and they they suffer from what is known as anorexia the ladies they they worry so much about their figure then eat less and less even when they eat very little still they think this will destroy my figure and they starve themselves it's happening so you can see to what extent ignorance can take you and there are men you know who eat too much that they look at the somo wrestlers roa somo wrestlers or there are others there there i mean very interesting we are living in a very interesting world kuto sokwa dinde doa mi chiji doa ina fit dun le ma yu ki ta ring dun ji ora subo ring dun fit dun le ma yu ki sokwa se doa ya jigo cha de kilo khasi na chik lembe ki sokwa se doa ta di lenge sokwa de so ta jakwa khujo ta mo thuki cha cha jore so there there are like uh, groups you know groups of people who are above 7 feet height and the groups of people who weigh certain <laughs> kilos you know 200 kilos or something you know so things like that so have moderation in food don't eat too little because you will have no energy to do the practice and also don't eat too much then you will feel sleepy you will also not be able to breathe properly yung do akala himbo je sa ne sa je me sa haro ya tan u ga tan tu mu se de di yung do ache da di phenge mu do ache da thama de dungi nyang do ene manju gak di je prawa sa sor bo shiwa and 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 it's based on one's own experience and if you just eat the right amount of the food you feel so healthy your mind will become much lighter and more fresh you see kala de ya do se di shido shido che no and then you should you should also you know take those foods which you are able to digest even if that food is very delicious and nice if your st- <laughs> the fire in your the fire of the digestive system is not so good you will not be able to digest it you see so you should be able to digest it even in the case of healthy person you know don't eat food before having digested the first food that you have taken and then the food should be something that you have not uh, acquired by wrong means by cheating people okay through negative emotions and also realize the fact it is not a good idea to crave too much about food kashi be the sibe mena shiro che de de sibe mena nga sa thumu tu se ga je ro ti do da an kashi kirmo mena nga sa be kirmo de inchi me je go da sa fo sa mo kirmo cha sa ta do kirmo kirmo ro sometimes i make i can make joke better than to better you see ro ti mo ne ro ta de re do wa so that is true you know so there are people who say oh i can't eat food without chili without spice you know it may not be good for your health but still addiction you see so we need to get rid of those kind of addictions addiction which comes through craving craving and grasping and last two or three years back we had this mind lab conference in his holiness office and the topic was on addiction so during that one of the presenter she said that the human brain has a natural capacity to judge what is right what is wrong natural capacity if you if you live it on that natural level i mean look at the body the amazing power to digest food 
You know, when you are hungry, the body tells you you are hungry. When you are thirsty, the body tells you, you know, it needs water and things like that. So the brain also has an amazing power to, to see what is right, what is wrong. There's natural capacity. But if you get addicted in something, then the addiction takes over to the power of that natural brain to judge between what is right and wrong. So it will stop functioning. Now see, so dangerous. Then the, that addicted part of the brain says, bring. <coughs> like for example, you, you can test this. If you're not a smoker, take the first puff, you will not release it. You will end up like coughing like anything. <laughs> but still, you try again, you try again. Then after some time, it looks okay. You, you stop coughing, you see. Then after that, even if you want to stop, the brain will say, no, 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 last time you gave me so many times the, the smoking, now bring. The brain dictates, it's getting addicted, you see. And then you can't stop. That's called addiction. So the addiction can be in many things. Addiction of tea, sweet, whatever. So you, you have to be careful, okay? So that you are able to function naturally. Mm. The, the reason that you should not develop too much craving to the food is, for example, if you look at the, 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 the material substance by which the food is made, However good the food looks, you know, sweet or delicious, whatever, once you put it in your mouth and chew it, it becomes dirty. And what you throw in the toilet, you know how dirty it is. So there's, there's not, what, what comes from the food is not worth developing too much craving. You know, it's only for, as Nagarjuna says in his letter to the friend, where he says the food should be seen as a medicine. And many of the Buddha sutras, the Buddha clearly said, food is a medicine. Now if food is a medicine, then do, in the case of medicine, do we take too, too much, two plates of, one or two plates of medicine? You see, we take not so much medicine like that. So similarly with the food also, too much or too little is not good. So that the result of food is either it will become urine or excretion or blood or pus or things like that. And then for getting that food, how much we have to work? The food doesn't come free, you see. So much work. You have to go to university, you have to study so many years. <laughs> then you have to get a job and then you are at the mercy of the, the one who had given you a job, you see. So, not worth developing too much craving and grasping. And then people fight over food. Friends get separated. And uh, if you don't have satisfaction, then the more you enjoy, the more craving there will be, and those who are, as I said, if you are somebody who has less contentment and, you know, <coughs> less desire, then because of your craving and grasping towards food, clothing, you need more and more. That more and more will not come freely, that more and more will have to come by working under somebody. So in a way, you, you will become a slave to someone else. Right? You can see those people who join army, for example, a clear example is, just for food, you are ready to go to the battle and get killed. You see, this is a clear example. But if you have more contentment and less, less, less desire, you will be more free and you will be able to then really enjoy the real meaning of human life. So there should be a limit. And for getting that food, how many type of negative emotions we cultivate? Fighting, killing, you know, like the, 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 the conflict and the war between different countries is all for money, food. And these days one very clear example is people are fighting over oil. 
Many powerful countries are fighting there in Syria for oil primarily. And that's not happening with Tibet because Tibet has no oil. Probably, if I'm not wrong. They may say they are defending this country, that country, but they are aiming for something else. So that's the thing. But if you use food and whatever at your disposal, if you use it properly, with contentment, then that can be facility for your spiritual practice, for your spiritual upliftment. So the end purpose of that food is so that you are able to remain healthy and you are able to live. Kala say the nayachi du marwa. Ina sama hitu nagore. Mine thamji seni ins lavre. Tane thamji jugne ins lavre. Me nasa mang cha sadama hina set on nagore. Mine thamji seni. There is a Tibetan thing which says that all the human sicknesses are sicknesses coming from food. By taking the wrong food or improper food. Which is true. I remember very well when I was working in His Holiness's office. So during, you know, after the office, I used to go at the crossroad in front of the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics. So there was a very, you know, small Indian boy who was selling this Golgapa, you know. I don't know how to translate this. It's a, you know, something, you know, filled with water, you know, sour water or something. Then they put it like this. Like this, Golgapa. So it's a very skinny little boy. So I used to go to him and tease him, you know. Are kya ho gaya? Itna dubla patla. Abko khana bhi nahi milta hai. Tere lag gaye ko gharo gaye kol. Kya kar sa? Guruji, jada bimar khane se hota hai. Dubla patle se nahi se lab samko gaya. And I said, how come you are so skinny, so small, you know? This little Indian boy who was selling this gold. He said, Guruji, you need to realize that all sicknesses come from eating, not from less, less eating. <laughs> Which was a big, big lesson, you know, similar to the teaching in the Lamrim, you know. No dusare. And then, moreover, the text says, receiving too many things from other people, if you don't have the power to digest, Mizani Kanjumunyo Sayedi Chidani Lela Yama Resegur. Savala Dendrol Nyingor is a dendrol dendrol nyisena Yamana so sudum yabu dending. Yamana lamga garo trava top de gendiji gores. Nandu namju mikuma in a mese savala chak and dumba go silagudua. Chak is chak and dumba in the gores lela yomer. There's a Tibetan saying which says in order to consume other people's food and gifts, you need a jaw that's made of iron. <laughs> That means you, you can't take it for granted, you know, when somebody is giving you something, you're getting something from other people. Don't, don't just take them and eat them so easily, you know. There's a beautiful words by Sabin Dalai Lama. Shen la shata tarfa senurji korze. Rāṅla ding me shindu mingumbar chebe Lekbe cha kuntebe dungu sundukwa Tukla mendu shembe nangsu di kyo vas The seventh Dalai Lama This is a beautiful quotation Shenla shatra tarfa senorji korze The food, the other wealth and other things that is offered to you He is talking to the monks I mean it can be referred to others also So the, the food, the, the wealth and other things that is offered to you you should know that these things that is offered to you is very dear to the one who makes you that offering. It's like his own flesh and blood. If you don't have the confidence, that you will be able to digest these offerings because of your morality, because of your spiritual practice. If you don't have that confidence, still, if you try to enjoy them without contentment, the end result will be all the good things that you have will vanish. 
all the merit, good things that you've done will merit, vanish. So this is real evil force. Like we check in the do you think do cigarettes? To go men to him and answer the job. So it is like actually a poison that you are consuming. But you are you are taking it as if it is a medicine. So he said, Alas, is this situation. We are seeing this poison as a medicine. It will become a poison to you because you don't have the morality. You don't have the practice. You don't have the compassion. Sungudwa. So lay low medua. Just a midula hit a go with this. Just on a chala go with you, she would share the Yahweh Samarwa. When we came into this world, we came empty handed. We brought nothing. When we go, also, we'll take nothing. So, why so much fuss in between? Of course, we need something, but not too much. Because of your merit, because of your luck, because of your effort, if you have so many things, okay, it's, it's fine. But still, don't develop too much craving and grasp. Because I'm going to say, 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 the Yaga is to do Koran the Bachimuch in a Sigoma, Michel, the Pendo Chicken, Tachi, Sarinza, Jujala, the Ming, the Tam Karim, Hiela down to Guyosa, then they made the little Takasu Niapores. Sanju Sembe Yamale, but in the Sosuchi put her out of Yam Lenching in Jena, Dillon Dujun Shoki Chevor Labudua. As on Dujun Shoki Chevor said, Gashik and Gomas in Nanjo Jan and the Ranzi and Yakora Remedus. Dujun Shoki, then a Kawayungas, then Gomas of Vigere. Dojun Shoki is <laughs> so soon to watch him by Jesse Wormado. Tibetan Dalla, the Chegumar Sevomarwa. So, in terms of your, your individual needs and purposes, there should be more contentment, less desire. For the purpose of many other sentient beings, there should be more projects, more work. So, in the case of a Bodhisattva, it talks about the six per perfection, the practice of the six perfections, practice of giving. If you don't have, what are you going to give? So you should have many things. But to, to have many things is not a problem because you have already dedicated everything for others. So the problem is the grasping and craving. What did it? What do you say? Then Then also in terms of your, how you sleep. First of all, as, as we discussed, you should spend a lot of time doing practice. Without sleeping, Yeah, the Gawashi was in a consumption of Timu Pedro or Silva, and they put your your Kuleba Pedro Tangu Yamarwa. If you get too much used with sleeping, then there will be more ignorance. Now, this is scientifically proved. As I said the, on the first day, if you don't use the brain, then the neural pathways will get blocked, it will, not, it will stop functioning. So the more you think, the more you use, the better it will be. You know? So therefore, do not, of course you need sleep, sleep is for resting, but not too much, too much. And then, of course you can't continue to practice the, for all the 24 hours, so you need to take rest, you need to sleep. So when you sleep, the process of the, the the conduct of sleep should be nice. That correct, na? Okay, that this is Allah Sare Allah Mughoche. So just for example, just before sleeping, try to remember what you have been doing this today, the good practices. Rawa, mani kun. And then think about those positive practices. Then, then sleep. Now because of the, the influence of this reflection that you did just before sleeping, it's very likely then the, in the, while you're sleeping, you continue to reflect on those positive practices. 
But instead, just before sleeping, if you watch a horror movie, <laughs> and then go to sleep, it's very likely that you will replay it, you see. They rewatch how do I and then food also, like just before sleeping, less food. Less food. Because the usual English or other saying is breakfast like a king. Right? King or prince? King. Breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, uh, dinner like a beggar. But the Tibetans, you know, now look at the Tibetans. <laughs> the Tibetans say, Shoge Kandu me be jagze sa. Ningung to do yin be jagze sa. Gungro ni la pe be jagze sa. So Tibetans say, have a heavy breakfast because it is not sure where you will land up in the day. <laughs> Sounds good, huh? Sounds true. So this is similar with the king. So this, there is agreement there. Then you might be thinking that the lunch may be a little bit less, like the prince, but the Tibetans know. They say have a heavy lunch because it is the real meal time. <laughs> Looks true. <laughs> then, you, then, then you go to the dinner. Now you must be thinking the dinner must be light. <laughs> the Tibetans say have a heavy dinner because it's good for your sleep. <laughs> But the, but the general, generally agreed thing, you know, scientifically found or based on one's own practice is also, if you eat a little bit less before sleeping, it's much better, okay? <coughs> and when you go to sleep, it is said that before you sleep, uh, you, you, you wash your feet. <laughs> wash your feet. And then sleep on the right side of your body. This is called lion's posture. Just, just as lion is the king of all the animals, you know, this is the symbolic meaning of being able to overpower the negative emotions, like the lion controls all other animals. And then also it is said that you will be able to get up earlier. I've tested with this a little bit and it really looks true. Because whenever I sleep on this side, because you can't sleep on this side for very, very long, then you have to change the side. I sleep on this, then I can't breathe properly. I've noticed this. Sometimes I start coughing, you know. Okay. So this on the right side. If you are unable to sleep the whole night, but more time on the right side. The, the sleeping face down, this is said to be the, the way of the animal. Sleeping like this, just like the celestial being. Sleeping like this, I have one Tibetan friend, you know. So once I was visiting Moscow, so we shared the room, you know. So I saw him, you know, with, with his legs, you know, withdrawn, you know. He was almost like a ball, you know. So... So this, this way of sleeping is said to be the way of the hungry ghost. <laughs> and uh, those who engage more in desire, they sleep on the left side of the body. This can be scientifically tested, you know. What lies on the right side, what kind of channels are there. And then you should sleep with the feeling of light and illumination. Not, not, the, not, not the perception of dullness or darkness, but light and illumination. And with mindfulness. And, and sometimes just before sleeping, if you recite a few verses or try to remember 
one or two lines, you know, it's very useful. Sometimes you are able to remember it so clearly in the night. Then the young do something. Get in the chigu, she would chigu, see Mada. No more than the touch it, then the chain, you love John Jan, you know, the mother thinks I'm talking about she would chigu, see Mada. Oh, do you say? That didn't remember among which do so is Jim do. The counter with the, the whether it's food, whether it's uh, your process of sleeping, and all this you should be mindful and aware. So there's the thing. No hmm? Thank you. Any questions? Parting question. No question. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Yes, it's two questions. First question is, which one is more fruitful? Focusing on an object outside or focusing on your mind, and what is second is what is the best way of uh, focusing on your mind. Sorry, no. Yeah? Second question. Yeah. What is the difference between the result of trying to watch it on you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Result, yeah, uh, result. On mind. Right. And then second uh, and. The process. The result of uh, try to focus on external object as Buddha stages huh. include the impermanent. Huh. Huh. In the beginning, it will be much more fruitful to meditate more on external objects because it will be it will not be so easy to meditate on your mind, okay? Because mind is non-physical, colorless, shapeless. But then gradually, I mean, not only meditating on the external object, but meditating on your mind is very much <coughs> encouraged. Now the best way of uh, meditating on your mind is, uh, it is said that the best way of meditation is ensure that your mind does not think about the past. Then also forget any plan about the future. Now when you don't think about anything that has happened in the past, any plan for the future, and in this state when you try to remain, then you will be able to get a kind of reflection of the so-called mind which may be probably like an energy, a kind of vacu vacuity. Because the, normally the mind is almost like filled with objects, you see. Whether it's seeing a flower or a door or a window or a human being, it is full of contents. Now when you think about, when you make an attempt not to think about the past, about the future, the mind becomes contentless, you see. So you get a kind of vacuity. So try to let your mind remain on that state. The Labgadua. The advantage of doing that is then it will help you stop <coughs> chasing the object. All the negative emotions are accumulated by chasing the object. It is very much encouraged in Dzogchen and many other higher tantric practices. But then Divya Chambu Yungu Yava Shikdua. So ordinarily also, therefore, as I write in the beginning also, also I briefly mentioned that 
that you should cultivate the long lasting peace and happiness from within not from outside that is what i mentioned right in the beginning so from within means let your mind remain as an observer of the things happening around but not chasing them not being entrapped by this ye do me you not have na yar ji tu jin jasu ji ki to zebar na ya demar me da shin khenja bo ma jasi la lin do jasi la lin na ye do me you not have when you encounter a very attractive beautiful object normally when we encounter a attractive beautiful object we just get obsessed with wow so nice i should have this bmw car or whatever you know tim do do adina ta ye do me you not have na ta kharche gor sana ti mayo tha bla ye do me you not have na yar ji tu jin jasu ji ki do you should see that attractive object just like a rainbow in the summer which looks beautiful but has no essence je par na ya de bar me da hi looks beautiful but no essence so it's useless to chase after that rainbow so similarly everything however attractive how to, however beautiful doesn't really have that ultimate true existence yo marwa ye jab bon ja se lore so through that we are able to remove craving attachment and all kind of negative emotions okay thank you thank you very much so let us dedicate the prayer uh, the the virtuous practices karse টক বাদ নাম জিগমে সব চিং নামনে থুজুর চিক থুমে নামনে থুদে চিং সেমনে ফিনজু ইঞ্জুর চিক তাদের সো লেট এস রিসাইড এন্ড রিফ্লেক্ট অন দিস প্রেয়ার এন্ড ইউ ক্যান রিপিট আফটার মে মে দোস উইথ ফিয়ার বি ফিয়ারলেস মে দোস আন্ডার বন্ডেজ বি ফ্রিড মে দোস পাওয়ারলেস বি এম্পাওয়ার্ড May our hearts join in friendship. Thank you very much. Thank you.